The house I grew up in was built in 1754 um, in Virginia, and I, I lived in an old historic town. And so I, I think I have an affinity for places with a lot of history because yesterday I walked around and I just felt so, I felt great. Anyway, I love it. I love it. And you guys are terrific, so friendly and, and kind. I appreciate it. We appreciate it very much. <laughs> I just want to go off at a, a quick tangent straight away. Is this a good enough distance between us? Because in Seinfeld, you were the close talker. Oh, yeah. And you were very, I don't know if any of you know him from Seinfeld, the Seinfeld episode. Well, I played, a guy who to people. I played a guy who talked too close to people that had no, he had no idea about personal space. He was challenged that way. And, and so, uh, yeah, what Chris is referring to is uh, uh, an episode where I play one of, I, I don't know who's, is Seinfeld popular here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay, okay. So um, I play one of a series of uh, Elaine's dysfunctional boyfriends, and, and so this guy talked too close to people. But the, thi the thing that was funny was that, um, that uh, Jerry was very uncomfortable with um, somebody invading his personal space, you know. And, and so he kept, he kept uh, like, uh, reflexively moving away. And so they almost had to put a sandbag there, you know. And they kept saying, closer, closer, closer. And so when we shot it, we were almost touching noses. And, and the cast was laughing so much because they knew how painful it was for him. So, yeah. Speaking of laughter on set, talk to me about Beverly Hills Cop and working with Eddie Murphy. How, how hard was it to keep a straight face during some of the scenes? Eddie was, uh, I don't know if people know that Saturday Night Live um, was going down the tubes. It really was. It, it had just run its course, and NBC told Lauren Michaels, the, the creator of the show, it's been a great run, but we're going to have to pull the plug. Lauren goes out and finds Eddie at 19 years old at Catch a Rising Star in New York, and he single-handedly, I'm not, single-handedly pulls the show out of the, the, the loop. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so... Yeah, a couple years later, he, was, he had done 48 hours, and then he left the show. He did it on his hiatus, and then when Beverly Hills Cop came along, uh, he left uh, and, um, SNL. <laughs> it does sound like a lightsaber you've got there. <laughs> is, anyone, is anyone here? Okay. Yeah, um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, he was... Well, he is, he's brilliantly funny to the point where you, you kind of, uh, you kind of hate him. No, <laughs> uh, but the, the, the thing was, is that it was originally, the movie was a, a, a vehicle for Sylvester Stallone because he, wow. had, yeah, he had just done Rocky. It wasn't a comedy. It was about a detective from Detroit who comes to Beverly Hills. He's a fish out of water. That part's still there. And he's come to avenge the death of his friend. That part's still there, but it's very serious. It's a vengeful. It would have been a very different story. Well, yeah, it's an action revenge story. And he meets a young rookie who gets thrown off a roof in the middle of top of the second act. You always have to have something in the middle of the film really, ha you know, big happen. And so I was thrilled. I was the first one. I was hired. Before. You were going to be thrown off the roof. Yeah, yeah. And I was so excited. You know, it was a terrible death, and I, I hadn't done anything. And, and so Stallone, who's, who's, you, you shouldn't underestimate him as a writer, because he wrote Rocky, and he wrote Rambo, and, you know, he took it on himself to, to rewrite the script. And it wasn't bad, but he, he put so much expense into it. He had Axel driving in that, 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 that messed up old Nova, Chevy Nova, driving down Rodeo Drive, which is the most expensive one of the most expensive streets in the world, smashing into Bentleys and, and Rolls Royces, and, and he added millions of dollars to the budget. And so even though he was their he, brand new minted star after Rocky, they, they didn't know what to do because they didn't want to spend that much money on the movie. I guess they didn't believe in it that much, I don't know. So they found this, this uh, uh, project called Cobra, and they brought Cobra to him, hoping that he would, you know, they said, ah, we know you like this Beverly Hills cop, but we think you'll like Cobra better. And he said, yeah, I do. And they're like, oh, oh my God, thank you. Now what are we gonna do? 
and I'm still cast saying, are they going to make the movie? And so uh, they ended up with Eddie, but it wasn't a comedy. So we had to write ourselves through it. And if, for Eddie, it was a breeze, but John and I, you know, we spent many an anxious moment on that. And um, all the scenes in the, the movie, if you're familiar with the original movie, where we're staking him out and we're talking and we're kind of the henpeck couple where I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, worried about how much coffee he drinks and all this stuff. That, that came, out of, uh, came out of us. But um, the, the one thing to answer your question is he's so funny and so much happens spur of the moment that if you see the movie again, whenever I put my hands in my pockets, it's to squeeze myself so hard to create so much pain like a masochist so I won't laugh because the most important thing is not to laugh because he comes up with most of this stuff, you know, right on the fly. And so, and John, who's also here, he goes like this. <laughs> but I put my hands in my pockets and that happens quite a few times in the film. So yeah, he's very funny. Yeah. You mentioned having to write the lines between you and, and the character of Taggart, John, who's here. Yeah. Um, one of those conversations, I have to ask you, is it true that the average American has four pounds of red meat in their colon? Oh God, I hope not. <laughs> but I actually had read it in a newspaper. I don't know if it's true or not, but I said, this is perfect for this scene. And, and Marty, the director, agreed. And so, yeah, you just pick things up, you know, because uh, you're desperate, right? There's nothing on the page. You get, <laughs> so you got to find something, you know? And. How much of the script was improvised by either yourselves or Eddie Murphy? Well, it, we, we worked it. It was not a comedy, so every day we worked, we worked ourselves through it to, to find funny stuff. We did have Sam Simon, who went on to create The Simpsons, was one of the most popular, we call them punch-up writers. They'll come in and they'll punch something up to make it funny, you know? And uh, so, uh, so we had him. But we couldn't rely on him, you know. So anyway, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of how it turned out. We worked really hard. Eddie didn't work as hard as we did. <laughs> he was so comfortable. He was totally in his element, so, yeah. I think we may have some questions out here in the audience. We have somebody right here on the front row. He's been here a while, and he desperately wants to ask. We've got somebody who's going to come over with a microphone for you. It's okay. <laughs> oh, here we go. We've got a new one here for you. Everyone get your questions ready. This is a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, really, isn't it? Here we go. Away you go. How are you Judge? What's oh, loud? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, come sit next to me. Judge, I wanted to ask you, you did so, so many amazing movies. Um, for me, personally, one of your greatest movies is Stripes. I wanted to ask you, what was it like working with Bill Murray, John Candy, and Harold Ramis as well? Thanks. Um, that was Cheech and Chong goes to the army. And Cheech and Chong didn't, their, their manager wanted so much money for them that Columbia said, you're out of your mind. And so uh, it was Cheech and Chong goes to the army. And then they, they decided they wanted to do the movie. Bill had just finished a, a film called Meatballs that had done very well. And so that's another one that they had to write their way through because it was funny, but it w Bill wasn't Cheech and Chong, you know? And so, uh, yeah, that's the story behind that. But um, yeah, it did really well. It did really well, it's my first film, and I'm barely in it, but yeah. Pardon? I'm sorry. What was it like being with John Candy? Oh my gosh, good question. John is one of the finest people I, I I've ever met. Uh, I mean, inside the business or out. Just fantastic. It loved everyone. You'd walk into his trailer and yeah, there, it'd be like the United Nations. It'd be like a farmer from down the way, a Hollywood executive. <laughs> he was just fantastic. And I had to tell him, I had to tell John Candy, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but in the United States, in some archaic places in the United States, especially in the South, they have what they call a dry county. And that means that they don't sell alcohol in the county, okay? Well, I, it fell on me to tell John Candy, who's one of the great Molson drinkers of all time from Canada, that what a dry county was. And he said, 
What, what do you mean? You mean the weather? The weather? I said, no, 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 no. It, it, they don't sell alcohol. <laughs> oh, you're funny. You're funny. Ah, you're funny, you are. No, no, it's for real. What? And so, what are we going to do? He wasn't an alcoholic. He just loved to party. Everybody, that's what was so great about John. And so, he said, where do we go? I said, Louisville is... Louisville, Kentucky is like an hour away. So cut to, we're in the car. <laughs> and, and, and so we found cases, uh, somehow he found cases of Molson, came, went back. We were on our own dime if we wanted another room. They paid for one room. He bought uh, a hotel room adjoining his and put all the beer in the bathtub with a bunch of ice. I loved him very much, loved him dearly. Great. There's lots more. Thank you very much for that. Great questions. We have more questions here, I think. There's a lady here in the uh, third row. Off you go. Hi, Judge. Um, when you look back at your career, are there any films that you maybe turned down that you wish that you had taken? And if not, um, are there any films out there that you wish you had been offered at the time? Um, yeah, there, you know, well, I turned down uh, Beetlejuice. Uh, because at the, and I turned down the Alec Baldwin role. Uh, the reason being was that the green screen CGI process was very new, and I was getting offers, and I said, nah, I don't want to deal with all that. <laughs> a silly reason. Um, and one that I wished, actually, it didn't turn out to be a big film, but it's called uh, What About Bob, a Bill Murray movie uh, about a, uh, a therapist, a psychiatrist and his most needy patient. And I thought that, well, for there was a 24-hour period before Bill wanted to do it that they were, they were going to come to me. And um, I loved the role because it was so needy, desperately needy. Bill didn't play it that way, but there was something very, very funny about someone who was so clingy. And so uh, it's really, you know, if you, if you don't get a movie you want, it's okay unless somebody doesn't do with the role, doesn't do the role justice. If somebody does the role justice, then I can let it go and say, oh, well, they did a good job. But um, Bill walked through that one. And so, anyway, I didn't want to get, I'm not, I don't walk around thinking about this, but that's the question. <laughs> At um, least not until today. Bigger movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were some movies that, um, you know, it's feast or famine, and when you're really, when you're really on top, they offer you. They just keep throwing money at you because they think that's the reason. And you know, um, oh, one of those films was didn't do well. It was with Madonna, um, that girl, or uh, who's that girl? Who's that girl? Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm very flattered. They didn't realize I didn't want to do it because she had all the funny lines. But they threw so much money at me, and, and my wife's like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to ever hear that story again. <laughs> so. Brilliant. Have we got any more questions here? Anyone else? Raise your hands if you've got more questions. If not, I will, I will carry on as well. Um, just tell me about your relationship working on set with John Ashton. How funny is he? You, you both seem to have real funny bones, and did you need that for a film like uh, that? It was wild come? because we didn't know each other, and he walked in. I was already cast. We we're looking for my partner and he walked in and I just thought, this is the guy, he's the veteran, you know? And, and we just clicked and it, it turned out, chemistry is a rare thing, you know? Uh, sometimes they'll just throw people together and not think about that, but we really did have a, a great thing going and, and you, don't really, you don't really maintain a lot of friendships because you're in this intense relationship for a brief period of time and then they cut you loose, but John and I have stayed friends all these years, and, and what's f most fun is when we walk down the street together and people think that we've walked right out of the film. You know, it's odd for them, so it's fun. I think one of the questions that people would, would like to throw at you today, but perhaps a little bit polite, a little bit shy, is Beverly Hills Cop 4. It's oh, yeah. often rumored about. Often. Is, it, is it likely? I've just stepped away from it because it's come up so much, you know? So hopefully they'll come and say, we want you to be in the movie. I, I don't, I really don't know anymore. I know Jerry Bruckheimer, the original producer, would be a part of it. 
I have a feeling that if it were to happen, there's a director named Craig Brewer that's worked with Eddie twice now on uh, My Name is Dolomite that's coming out soon. And then Coming to America, the remake of Coming to America. So he's working with the same director, okay? And um, if for Filmophiles, he did Hustle and Flow as his Greg Brewer's uh, debut. So I think Eddie's found a, a real good creative partner, and maybe that'll extend to Beverly Hills Cop 4, but I don't, I, I don't know. It's just, it was, uh, he had just mentioned it uh, last week. But I have the I have the newspaper man asking me about it and and uh, everybody's but I, I I don't know. I mean, you know what the internet internet's like for for rumors yeah, yeah. and things like that. There's yeah. so many rumors of what the script would be. Yeah. But one of them I found quite alarming from your point of view because it was set after the death of Billy Rosewood. Oh my! <laughs> How would well, you feel about that? Well, obviously I wouldn't feel very good about it <laughs> unless he came back from the dead, which I, it's a kind of different movie. But um, who came up with that? <laughs> it's just one of those internet uh, rumors that's going on. I think on. it's I'm a sure terrible. I think it's a terrible idea, of course. <laughs> so let's scrap that idea. Terrible. Uh, we, we mentioned about Eddie Murphy and his and potentially uh, coming back to do uh, stand up again. Eddie Murphy. Yeah, that's what he wants to do. Um, Eddie is uh, he's really a family guy. When you go up there, he's with his. He's got nine kids. He adores. And he likes a lot of action at home. He just likes a lot of people coming in and out. And um, he just hasn't, he feels like he, he hasn't engaged culturally. And so, um, yeah, he does want to do stand up, especially with Netflix is offering him a ridiculous amount of money to do. Uh, this Netflix, they have a lot of money. Uh, they have, Chris Rock was offered, uh, uh, I, I can't say, but I, a ridiculous amount of money to do his his two specials and Eddie is it's just off the chart so I think it's safe to say Eddie's going to be doing stand up again <laughs> because you see they they make so much money they their subscribers are all over the world and they have to have constant content so it's a golden age of television and um, and so yeah they just they get what they want you know and you mentioned Chris Rock there. He was in Beverly Hills Cop 2 as well, wasn't he? So Who? Chris Rock. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm lucky enough. I'm lucky enough to say that uh, I... Uh, how many people can say that they drove a cement truck up to the Playboy Mansion and Chris Rock valeted the car, you know? Um, Chris was... Uh, he's 18 or 19, hung out with Eddie a lot. He was part of Eddie's crew. And... Um, Really delightful, really, really good guy, really good guy. And you mentioned just when we were chatting off stage that you might be doing a bit of a, a Netflix special as well. Well, they're throwing money around and I've never done stand up, but I might try considering what they're offering. <laughs> Again, it's that they have to have the content, you know. And so, uh, yeah, um, I have I've, I have a lot of cocktail napkins over the years of funny stories. Um, I don't, I mean, I know that it's a skill, but I do have a relationship with the audience that I, so yeah, I think I might try it, yeah. Because they, they're offering a, a bit of money, yeah. Can, can you let us into one of those cocktail napkin stories today? Maybe to end on? Um, well, I don't know, I, I don't know if this is, is one of them, but something happened to me yesterday that really put me in my place in a good way. There were uh, two parents with two young kids in, in, uh, uh, in prams. And uh, they approached me in uh, the green market, right, the square. And they said, can we get a picture? And I took my sunglasses off like, yeah, OK. And then they handed me their camera. <laughs> <laughs> and so I took several pictures of them. So it's like, you know, slice of life stuff. Fantastic. Well, it's been absolutely fantastic to have him here today, hasn't oh, it? Ladies and gentlemen, why don't we give it up for the legendary Judge Reinhold.